We're going to bow our heads for prayer before we go to the study today. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you again. Thank you for this heavenly honor, Lord God, that you place upon us. It is just completely humbling, oh dear God. We are so unworthy of the blessing that you have prepared for us today. Lord, as we turn our hearts to you, as we listen to your voice, as we are invited to walk in your presence, as we behold your righteousness and your holiness, we pray, mighty God, that our hearts would truly be humbled. God, that we would recognize the times we're living in and the truth that is demanded of our lives, the commitment and the perseverance and the surrender that you demand of your people, Lord, in these last days. Father, as we come to your word, we humbly pray that your spirit will be our guide, that you would take our hearts high above from the cares and presses of this world, that we will keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, knowing that there is no better way, there is no greater solution. Jesus is the way, and he's teaching us his way in the sanctuary. Thank you for how far you've led us in this marvelous study, Lord. And we just plead with thee that you would continue to take us deeper and further still as we sit at your feet. We're claiming your victory and an empowerment of your Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, welcome, friends. Ah, uh, God has God has just been doing so much, and we truly just give God glory for all His hard labors of love and His repeated invitations to come and walk with Him as He leads the way in the sanctuary. And I invite you again to continually just perpetually keep paying attention to God's word to keep taking your mind back to the sanctuary back to learning God's way as he teaches us and and takes us through the the sanctuary life our theme text as you've been with us has been Exodus 25 8 where the Lord tells us his appeal to us saying let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them that if they're willing to be set apart then I'm so willing to be in their midst, to be their Emmanuel. We find how God comes and begins his ministry, not in, this, in the sanctuary, but by living with the people in the camp. That is, of course, John 1.14, where he dwelt among us and, and we beheld his glory, John tells us, before he started his priestly work. We find the altar belongs to Jesus, not just the sacrifice, in it, but the altar itself points to Jesus Christ which takes us to the next article in the Agro Court, which is the laver where the priest would be cleansing himself. He would frequent the laver. And Jesus picks up the symbolism of the water in John 7, 37 to 39 and connects it to the Holy Spirit. And so the cleansing that the priest was receiving through that little water, God is inviting us to receive the cleansing through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who seeks to keep us cleansed with that renewing and refreshing. We then enter the holy place and we find out how God has given us these three legs in our Christian experience. The experience of Bible study at the table of showbread, uh, the prayer life represented by the altar of incense, the candlestick representing our witness, our shining to the world. And God is wanting us to check these legs. A Christian has these three legs, a tripod of holiness that God wants us to make sure these legs are erect, they're firm, they're strong, so that we can be growing in our Christian experience. That has brought us to this final phase of this final experience, this final compartment of the sanctuary, which is the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the high priest enters there on the Day of Atonement. And, and it is the Day of Atonement that we're taking a look at. We've looked at the articles inside, the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, the Ten Commandments. We've studied the mercy seat. I mean, these are beautiful subjects we've looked at. We've also looked at the Day of Atonement a bit, looked at how there were two goats that were brought. One was for the devil, one was for the Lord. How the blood is sprinkled seven times, representing how Jesus had bled seven times. And his, his sacrifice, the blood that he has shed for us, is more than enough. Seven drops, number representing completion. He has completely paid the price and and seeks to deliver us and give us victory. So, so just beautiful, beautiful themes. 
Today, though, we're going to go study a little bit deeper. As we look at the Day of Atonement, we recognize it was a yearly experience. Every year, once a year, it was an annual service as known as the Day of Atonement. Now, it was the Day of Cleansing as well as the Day of Atonement, also better known as the Day of Judgment. The experience was that Israel would bring their sin through those animals, the blood would be taken, sprinkled on the veil, and as blood was sprinkled, the stains would stay there throughout the year. On the Day of Atonement is when the sanctuary, as Daniel 8, 14 tells, the sanctuary was cleansed. It was purified. It was a judgment day, and those who had brought their sin, follow closely, those who had already brought their sin to the sanctuary, their sins were being cleansed and forgiven. If you had not, you would be cut off from your people. So this was very significant, a very sacred, sacred time for all of Israel. The reason why we're paying attention to this is, friends, because Daniel 8, 14 tells us that unto 2,300 days and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We see that the 2,300 year prophecy comes to an end in 1844. And that's when we recognize that cleansing has begun. When the cleansing happened in the sanctuary, that's also the day of atonement, also the day of judgment. It is only on the day of atonement that the priest moves from the holy place to the most holy place to be to partake of the judgment experience. Now, this is significant because looking at the sanctuary, we've already studied this. We've seen how the movements in the sanctuary, rather, I don't, know if, I don't think we've gotten into that. But if you want to know where Jesus is, you should simply study the sanctuary. It tells us, I believe we looked at the quote, though, from the prophet telling us that studying the sanctuary teaches us the, the work and position of our high priest. Just as it teaches us our work and position in these last days. So it's, it's beautiful. So we recognize after 1844, after 2300 years, we find that the high priest enters into his priestly, the, the experience of judgment the cleansing of the sanctuary. So post-1844, you and I have been living in the anti-typical Day of Atonement. That was the typical Day of Atonement in the, Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew economy. But now we're looking at our day and age. And since 1844, in, in the hands of prophecy, the prophecy tells us that since 1844, you and I have been living in that period of judgment, in that Day of Atonement, in that anti-typical Day of Atonement, you could say. And that's God's invitation for us to, to come and partake, to perceive, to pay attention. This very important event, this time, this season of judgment that you and I are living in, this was an experience that the children of Israel had to go through as well. Now, there are vital lessons that God wants us to learn from them. Let's take a brief look at this text. Leviticus 23, 27 tells us, on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, if you're paying attention, friends, the Bible tells us on the day of atonement, it was the 10th day of the seventh month. By the way, that's the Jewish calendar. All right, and in the Jewish calendar, uh, they do not begin. The Jewish calendar does not begin on our January. All right, when our when we're having January, that's not when the Jewish calendar begins. The because and, I, and I'll explain this a little bit. In Exodus twelve, if you read, this is the time when God delivers Israel from Egypt, and as God takes Israel out of Egypt, God tells Israel, "Today that I deliver you, this is the day you will start counting the year from." Let me, in fact, give you the text there. Uh, if you're with me, let's just quickly go to Exodus chapter 12. And we can start reading from verse 1. Yes, Exodus 12, verse 1. God is going to let them experience the Passover. He's going to deliver them. So notice what he says. Exodus 12, 1 says, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So interesting. As he's delivering them from Egypt, he says, this month will be the first month. This will be the first month of the year to you. Today that I deliver you, this is from the time when you will start counting the year. Now, when you compare it to our modern day Gregorian calendar, we recognize that that first month, also known in the Jewish calendar, the month of Abib or the month of Nisan, these are the Jewish names for that month. 
which was the month of the Passover, it's interesting that that month of Abib actually is somewhere around our March. Somewhere around our March is when their month of Abib, the first month of the Jewish calendar actually begins. Why this is important is because then the seventh day, the seventh, the tenth day of the seventh month actually comes down to our tenth month and the 22nd day. The 10th month is October and the day is 22. So 22nd October. Hmm. Maybe you are more familiar with that date. In 1844, that's what the brethren were looking forward to. They had not made up this date. They were following the Jewish calendar. They were following the Jewish and the Jewish typical day of atonement and compared it to the present day calendar and found out what would be this, this, this right time? What would be the day? Uh, what would be the seventh, tenth day of the seventh month in the present calendar? So that's how they, they came to that. Now, as you read carefully, it says in verse 27 that on this day of atonement, there were certain requirements, certain things God demanded. Number one, he says it will be a holy convocation. Number two, he says you will have to afflict your souls in this day of atonement. Three, he says, make an offering made by fire. And lastly, he says, do no work at all on that day of atonement. Now, I posit to you, friends, that all of these requirements that God presents to Israel are actually requirements God demands of us today as we live in the anti-typical day of atonement. Sure, we're not asked to erect an altar, we're not asked to sacrifice animals, but the principles, pay, care, pay close attention, the principles apply very solemnly to our time. Pastor Dwayne Lemon actually does a whole series on this. I'm just taking snippets of a long series uh, on, the, on, the, on the subject because just so blessed, so blessed by the truths that are presented there. Uh, let, let's take a look at this first quote. The prophet says, anciently the Lord instructed his people to assemble three times a year for his worship. To these what? Holy convocations. The children of Israel came, bringing to the house of God their tithes, their sin offerings, and their offering of gratitude. They met to recount God's mercies. Wow. They met to recount God's mercies, to make known his wonderful works, and to offer praise and thanksgiving to his name. Let's, let's review this. On the Day of Atonement was also a, a holy convocation. But as people came together, notice the purpose of coming together was to recount, to relive God's mercies and to make known his wonderful works and to offer praise and thanksgiving to his name. This is so deeply significant, my friends, because as we live in the anti-typical day of atonement, do you think God does not require us to have holy convocations, to have holy gatherings? Is it not demanded of us then? Is it not required of us that when we come together for, for, for prayer meetings, when we come together for Bible studies, for worship experiences like this, God requires of us that our gatherings are, 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 not, are, are not for any worldly business. Our gatherings are meant for a deep, sincere, holy experience. God's inviting us to experience that. That we are to make sure our gatherings are holy in nature. How often? This is a question we want to ask ourselves. You see, as Israel came together on the Day of Atonement, they, they, they could not joke. They could not sort of play around. Why? Because judgment was taking place. Are you catching this? Judgment. I mean, my, my life was on the line. My case was being judged. Can you imagine someone's case is being judged? It's a life and death matter. And can you imagine him playing around, joking about? His life is in the, on the line. And as Israel fixed their eyes, catch this. They could not see the high priest. Why? Because he had walked in. So they could not see the high priest, but they knew he's working on my judgment. Are you following the connections? We don't see our high priest, but we know he's carrying on the work of our judgment, of our atonement. And just as Israel, although they could not see their, by, by, by their eyes of faith, their minds were fixed on their high priest in the sanctuary. And so for us, while we don't see our high priest, are our minds fixed by, by faith? Are we seeing him ministering for our salvation in the heavenly sanctuary? Do we recount God's mercies as we meet? Do we make known his wonderful works? Do we offer praise and thanksgiving to his name? The prophet continues to say they were to unite 
in the sacrificial service, which pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Let's pause there, all right? They were to unite in what? In sacrificial service. What did we study when we're looking at the outer court? What did we study about the altar? They were not just to look at the Lamb on the altar. Rather, we are invited, as Romans 12 puts it, that we are to be what? A living sacrifice for the Lord. And the Lord is saying we are to unite in putting ourselves on the altar, humbling ourselves one before the other, placing ourselves on the altar of God and saying, Lord, do what you please with me. Do what you please with me. Thus, they were to be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. Wow. Even if we don't go any further, what a powerful message that is. That if we learn to place as we come together to humble ourselves and place ourselves on the altar of God, we will be preserved these holy experiences. And friends, if our gatherings became more and more holy, the prophet tells us if every Sabbath we engage, listen carefully to this qualifying mark. She says, if every Sabbath we engage in spiritual exercises, spiritual exercises, not fun and games, but if every Sabbath we come together and engage in deep spiritual exercises. She says the holiness of the Sabbath will be with us through the rest of the week. Praise God. The holiness, the power of the Sabbath will linger with us, will sustain us through the rest of the coming week. And so here God speak to us here. Saying that if we engage, if we come together and engage in this sacrificial service as we put ourselves on the altar. As we're pointed to Jesus. Who will take away our sins. We will be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. We'll be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. Let's take a look at that, at that first requirement, Leviticus 23, 27. The Lord says, as you come together, number one, you should have a holy convocation. That's God's command. The first thing I require of you is to have a holy convocation. Someone saying, but why does, why does God require us to be holy? I mean, is it, why is it so important for us to come together and for us to unite in holiness? Here's the answer. First Peter 1. As he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. How simple. How simple. Why is he asking us to be holy? Because he's holy. And if we are to unite with him, if we are to become his bride, can an unholy bride become the bride of one who is all holy? Are you following, friends? Can a blemished bride become, can a blemished woman become the bride of, of a spotless man? And so what is God doing? God's asking us to, inviting us to cleanse us, to purify us, to prepare us for that that eternity with himself so he says you be holy because i am holy and this is not a challenge he's not saying do it on your own no 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 if i am holy i will be your holiness i will teach you i christ is our righteousness the bible tells us someone says i like that someone says i like the idea i want to live a holy life but problem is brother how do i experience that holiness Often we talk about the what and what and what. We don't talk about the how. This is what is needed. We get it. But, but how do we get there? The answer comes to us in the next verse. It's so beautiful. He who has called you is holy. Be ye be holy in all manner of conversation. Right? In other words, in every conversation, holiness should be spoken of. Holiness should be felt and experienced. Be holy because he is holy. That's God's command. His requirement is demand. But God, how can I experience this holiness? The answer is so simple. Verse 17 says, if you call on the Father. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that simple? Be holy for I am holy. Lord, how do I get this? Just call upon the Father. If you want to taste that holiness, it's that simple. Just call upon the Lord. My life is blemished and stained. I've tried to clean myself, but to no avail. God, how do I experience? How do I taste the beauty of righteousness in Jesus? The Lord says it's simple. Just call upon me and I'll be there. Isn't that what the Bible says? Call upon me and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't even know of. 
The Prophet said, there's a thousand ways for God to provide for us that we know nothing of. If we but call on the Father. And let us stop trying to connive a plan on our own to make ourselves holy. Because we can make ourselves holy. It's so simple. It's the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, not you and I. We don't have the power to remove sins from our life. It's the Lamb that has the power to remove these sins. Just call upon the Father. It's important. Question is, so God says we ought to be having holy convocations, right? Someone says, well, that's important. And so, yes, so maybe that means God is saying every time we come to church, we should come together in holiness, right? We should just have holy convocations just there. Truth is, friends, you can't have holy convocations if the only time you partake of holiness is in the church. Let me say that again. You can't have holy convocations if the only time you seek holiness is when you step into the church, when you step into that gathering. If that's the only time you're seeking holiness, you won't get it. You won't experience that power, that potency, no. This intermittent seeking is not going to work. Holiness starts at home. Yes. Let me say that again. Holiness starts at home. That's where it begins. And where there is no holiness at home, we won't be able to bring any holiness to the church. Holiness starts at home. God's inviting you and I, friends, to be partakers of that. How are our homes today? How are our homes today? There was a survey done among young people. And the question was asked, why do young people leave the church? Right? That's the question. Why do young people, why are young people leaving the church? You'd expect them to say, oh, the music is not so good. It's not, you know, upbeat like the rest of the churches. That wasn't the reason. They didn't say, oh, the sermons are boring. That's not the reason either. The num I mean, could have been some percentage of the people answering that. But the number one reason was that young people gave for leaving the church. He said, it's because of parents. How strange, how shocking. Parents? He said, the reason we've left the church is parents. And so, I guess the question is, why parents? Parents go to church, so why did you stop going? So it's, I guess it's pointed that the, the same parents who will be, before going to church, they're at home. And at home, they're talking about some church member. Oh, that elder, what does he think of himself? You know, How dare he say that to me? Or, you know, why wasn't I given that position? Or I can do a better job at that. Or, all kinds of that things, all this hatred and malice. You're right before going to church on the Sabbath. And then they see the same parent, you know, shouting perhaps at the spouse and angry and upset. And the moment they get to church, that father meets the same elder who he was talking bad about. Meets that same elder, shake hands, oh, elder, happy Sabbath, so good to see. Children saw that and it's like, whoa, what? He was just saying this behind his back and look at here, they such great friends. They see the mother perhaps saying something about the head deaconess or you know one of the sisters in church, some brother in church. But then mother also coming and shaking hands and putting up the smile while a while ago they were upset at each other. Shouting at the children for being late, getting to church. Themselves unhappy in their marriage, fighting, but when they come to church, oh, they present themselves such a loving couple. I guess the answer of the youth was, if this is what church is with so much hypocrisy, show one face in the church, show one face at home. If this is what church is, we don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. Holiness begins at home, friends. And as a family, we are to partake of holiness so that we can carry that same holy atmosphere to the church. The prophet tells us, Adventist home, for parents, to neglect the duty of praying with our children is to lose one of the greatest blessings within our reach. Let's read that again. To neglect the duty of praying, it doesn't say praying for, no, 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 that's different. It's one thing to pray for your children. It's another thing to pray with your children. 
And the Prophet says to neglect the duty of praying with our children is to lose one of the greatest blessings within our reach. One of the greatest helps amid the perplexities, cares, and burdens of our life work to neglect this duty is to lose one of the greatest blessings. So how often, dear friends, how often do you stop your children and say, let me pray with you? Let me pray with you. Sure, they know you're praying for them, but how often do you sort of say, please, can, I, can you give me just one minute, 30 seconds, can you give me just that? I just need to quickly pray with you. Can you please allow me to pray with you? Please allow me to pray with you. It's important, friends. As a child, myself, who has parents, I can tell you, I need the prayers of my parents. I need it. I need it. Your children may not tell you, but trust me, they need it. The prophet says, parents are to cooperate with God by bringing their children up in his love and fear. Listen to the next words. They cannot displease him more than by neglecting to train their children aright. Wow. Wow. We cannot displease God more than by neglecting to train our children aright. Brothers and sisters, holiness begins at home. Holiness does not begin in church. It begins at home so that it can move over. A family that's living in holiness through the week can then carry that holiness into church the following Sabbath. That's what God is asking. That's what God is demanding of us. Are there some practical steps you can take? Well, we just looked at some. What is Paul's recommendation? Philippians 4, 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. All right, holiness has to begin here. In your mind, as a parent, as a child, so that you can share it with the rest of the family. So think about these things. Now, the English says, you know, sort of sit back and sort of think on these good things. The Greek puts it differently. See, in the Greek, the word think is the word logizomai. Now, logizomai literally means to take an inventory. All right? Logizomai means to take an inventory. Give me an example. Uh, imagine a shopkeeper, as he begins the day, he sees, okay, he's got 10 bottles of shampoo. He's got sort of five bottles of coconut oil and he's got, you know, two sacks of flour. He looks at all of this and he puts down on the list. This is how much he has. As he sells through the day, by the end of the day, he checks that list again and he recognizes, okay, now I have five bottles of shampoos left. I have just one bottle of coconut oil. I have one more sack left. So he's checking what is gone, what needs to be replaced now. He needs to bring back the five bottles that have been sold. He needs to replace those. So he's checking what's missing so that he can fill up the supply. See, that's what Paul is saying. Don't just sit and think about this thing. He's not taking inventory. Is my mind dwelling upon true things? How much of truth and honesty and just and purity and loveliness, how much of these things are in my mind? How much, of, how much time is, is my life surrounded by these qualities, by these, by these attributes? How much do I, do I surround myself with these experiences? That's what the Bible is asking. Take an inventory. Assess your life. Check. Check these things. Check these things in your heart. Check these things in your home. Somebody put it beautifully. Someone said, if you put this text in front of your television, if you take this text and put it in front of your television, you'll never watch television. Let me say that again. If you take this text, whatsoever things are true, pure, holy, just, lovely, good report, virtue, if there's any praise, think of this, is watch these things. But if you put this text, there'll be nothing there that you could watch because just the content in all kinds of ways that it's projected. Holy convocation. Friend, holy convocations, holy gatherings have to begin at home so that we can start seeing them in the church. Did you hear that? Holy convocations have to begin with my family. As a home, we should be congregating in holiness so that we can start coming together in holiness in our churches. If there's no holiness at home, there will be no holiness in the church. That's just the first one. 
That's just the first requirement that God speaks of. Calling us to partake of, of that great and righteous experience. Let's take a look at just one more before we close. Leviticus 23 and verse 27, after God says, you shall have a holy convocation. Secondly, he says, you should afflict your soul. You should afflict your soul. Now, when you look at this text, what it really means is to not beat yourself up physically, but it really means to abase yourself, to humble yourself. It's powerful. And here's what's interesting. If you come seeking holiness and come together in holiness, you can't be proud. You see how they both connect? He who is proud will never want to connect with others in holiness. Does that make sense? He who is proud will not want to come together with others in holiness. That's why Judas was so proud. It's like, what is Jesus doing? He was, he was convinced Jesus can't be the king. He's washing my feet. What is that? If you seek holiness, it will humble you, afflict your soul. Afflict your soul. And friends, here's the thing. If you keep judgment in mind, since, since 1844, as we're living in the period of judgment for Israel, as they knew their case is being decided, there was no way, there was no way they could be proud knowing that their life is on the line, their case is being judged. Similarly, if our eyes are fixed by faith upon the heavenly sanctuary, we will find no time to be proud because we know my case is being decided. I don't have time. To, I mean, how could I be proud when my life hangs in the balance? Humble yourself in the light of judgment. Humble yourself. In fact, in fact, notice how serious this was. In verse 29, God says, whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day. In other words, whoever does not humble himself in that same day, he will be cut off from among his people. This is how serious this was. God says, if you don't humble yourself on that day, you will be cut off, killed, out. You won't be able to stand. What that means is that there's no place for pride in judgment. There's no place for pride in the kingdom of God. You cannot be a part of God's kingdom if you're still cherishing self, if you still think you're better than anyone else. There's no place for us there. Whatsoever soul it shall be that is not afflicted in that same day will be cut off from among his people. It's, the, it's, it's a true word, friends. It is a true word of the Lord. Let us learn to humble ourselves. Let us learn to seek his face. Friends, as we live in this anti-typical day of atonement, God invites us to come together in our homes and in our churches as holy convocations. God's inviting us to humble ourselves. There is no place for pride in the kingdom of God. Let us seek Christ. For when Christ is living within, pride will not be able to live with it. Seek Jesus. Invite him afresh and he will help us. Is there someone who wants to take this period of judgment more seriously and say, Lord God, I've been trifling with these moments. I should be fixing my mind upon the sanctuary, and but my mind is too fixed upon the world, upon daily life. My mind should be fixed upon Jesus. If that's your desire, can I invite you, if you're able, to kneel with me as we pray? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for the power and the beauty of your word, Lord. Thank you for the blessed assurances that you give us in your word, promising us, God, that you are with us till the end. Father, we're given such a special gift in the sanctuary. We are being taught such beautiful truths, such wonderful promises. Such precious gifts are being given us, assuring us that God is longing to save his people. Lord, what a, what a wondrous privilege is ours. Humble our hearts, please. Help us to seek your face. Help us to trust in thee. And help us, Lord, to seek you. And you've just taught us today, if we are desiring holiness, all we've got to do is call upon you. 
to seek you, to invite you, that you may live within us and give us life we don't have. So thank you, God. Thank you because you've promised to do exceedingly abundantly more than what we could ever ask or imagine. So we claim your victory, your holiness, and your humility in our lives by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.